everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Matthias. I should maybe say a few words about myself um, while the slides are still getting set up. Uh, I'm have some difficulty getting them to be shown full screen, so I hope you can, can see what's up here on the screen. If not, or just come closer to the front uh, so you can make out what I'm showing. Sure. Um, yeah, as I said, my name is Matthias. I have been working on GNOME things uh, for a long time. I think I started contributing to GTK in around 2002, and I have been doing that ever since. And my day job nowadays is as a manager at Red Hat. I manage the part of the desktop team there. We use the part of the desktop team nowadays. It's called the display system team. Um, but uh, Globe is still my home base. It's, it's what I work on every day when I feel at home. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But if you really want to see uh, one of the original GNOME um, founders in action, you have to be in the other room where Federico was presenting today. Federico was one of the founders of GNOME. I'm just a baby compared to him. But uh, let's see how it goes. And if you, have, if you have worked on things uh, for as long as Federico and myself, uh, it can become, uh, you can become blind to the complexities of the technologies that you're working with. We both have uh, been involved in creating many different things, the underlying technologies that are used in the world nowadays, we uh, work with them every day. So uh, they become second nature for us, we don't think about this anymore. And uh, yeah, you can come to mind to, to how complex of a system uh, the functional desktop actually is. Uh, but if you uh, take a step back, um, then you have to admit that it can be a daunting task to, if you're a newcomer and you haven't really spent half your life uh, working on these things, it can be an daunting task to, to, to find out how to contribute and how to find out uh, how all these things interact with each other. Because you really have a, a, a whole labyrinth of uh, modules and technologies um, that you have to find your way through. Yeah. As I was saying, uh, it's a bit of a labyrinth, uh, so uh, this is a welcome not just to my talk, but also a, a welcome to this labyrinth. Uh, what I try to do in my presentation today is a bit different from the talks I normally give, where I take some technology um, topic that I'm next on and I try to dive really deep and expand this. Today I want to um, try to uh, get an overview of how Globe works. Uh, from a technical perspective, but without diving too deeply into details and not assuming too much prior knowledge so that uh, this can serve as maybe some orientation so that you as a newcomer can have uh, some ideas of how things fit together and how the desktop as a whole functions without getting lost in the weeds and in the details. So after the talk, you can tell me how well I did and I probably will feel, but we'll see. So, that's that. And, uh, when I started preparing for this talk, uh, I asked myself, so how do I start this? One way to go would be to just uh, look at the UI of the desktop. You can see here, empty GNOME desktop, and try to uh, explain what the different pieces are, how they come to be, and how they fit together. Or another way to start would be to look at the APIs and various libraries that you use in the desktop and look how they contribute to the building the desktop. Um, but maybe the the most natural way of uh, doing this would be to just uh, log into GNOME and then look around what is actually what is running, like what processes do exist after I logged in. So that is what I decided um, to do. And while the desktop looks empty after you logged in, there's already a whole lot going on. If you go to the next slide. Um, so I decided to just uh, start out with like, listing the processes um, that are running in my desktop. And one tool to use for that is called PS. Here I use a uh, sort of fancy cousin PS3. It does not just give you a list of the processes, but it also shows you how they are related to each other. One process calls another. Um, this tool will show you a little uh, tree relationship between the two processes. And as you can see, um, the list is too long to fit on one slide. And it is probably a bit too small to read, but if you, if you can make out a small print, you see in the middle of the slide here on the left, uh, system B. That's one of the processes that. Um, spawns a lot of the other, other things that are running here. 
if you go to the next slide. As you can see, uh, it keeps going, this list, there's a whole lot of processes, and um, uh, it doesn't even show the two slides. Um, you might, might see some names on this slide, if you can make them out, that, uh, that you've heard before. Um, towards the bottom here, you can see GNOME Shell, which is the compositor that is um, rendering everything that you see on the desktop at the end of the day. And you know GNOME Shell, to the right, you see it's called the x ray process, which is an X-server that we run, so that X11 applications can also um, appear on the desktop even though the compositor is, uh, is uh, speaking the way and the way. If you move to the next slide. Yeah, so this list keeps going. And, um, if you uh, pay close attention, you'll probably notice that uh, you can also see several applications showing up here. Um, there's the element at the top, which is a chat application. And then there's TextShop, everything around, which is another chat application that I was running on my desktop at the time because so I, so I took this screenshot. And then there's uh, LibreOffice, a little further down. The LibreOffice uh, binary is still called SOffice because LibreOffice uh, was called StarOffice in the distant past. And I was making my slides, so that's why LibreOffice uh, is running here. And then, of course, there's a uh, long terminal at the very bottom. Yeah, this list still keeps going. Um, uh, in this section of the tree, um, there's a whole lot of processes uh, whose names start with the tree fix GSD. Those are all uh, part of uh, the module called GNOME Static Steamer. Originally, when GNOME Static Steamer was created, we were just running a single process actually called GNOME Static Steamer. But uh, since that's a tool that uh, handles a lot of different things, you can see that here it's not just responsible for keyboards, but also media keys, power management, printers, screen savers, and all the different uh, things that the desktop has settings for. So at, one, at some point we decided that uh, it would be better to split it into individual processes because otherwise um, the bug in any of these components could hang or crash the whole settings team. And if we split it into separate processes, then um, they are more independent of each other and the whole system is more robust. A bit further down uh, the list, um, there's also a bunch of processes whose names start with the prefix GVFS. They are all part of the, the module called GVFS, which implements uh, virtual file systems um, for the desktop. So that you can access things like remote file shares or uh, SD cards or uh, media players and that sort of thing. Alright, uh, next slide. Yeah, we're still uh, going through this list, but we're getting towards the bottom. Uh, here you can you see a, a few more uh, services that uh, provide functionality to the rest of the desktop. For example, in the middle of the screen, uh, you see Pipewire, which manages uh, audio and video streams and devices uh, for the application for the desktop. And uh, the last few services on this list, uh, very modern here, are part of the FlatBank ecosystem. There's uh, the processes that implement it. Like portals, uh, the document store, the permission store. Um, with that, we're finally at the end of the uh, process listing. And uh, I hope this list was not too intimidating and uh, scary, but if you just take all the names from the list and you put them on one slide, it fills up the whole slide. Um, so there's really an impressive amount of uh, things that are running just after logging in. And, uh, I won't have the time. Just take a look at the, a few of the main components and explain them. It's a very good idea uh, for what's going on. So we'll go to the next slide. So that, that's what I'll what I do um, in the remainder of the talk. But before we get there, I want to take a brief moment uh, to talk about basics of uh, how the Unix processes um, work, because having some idea uh, of process mechanics will make it a lot easier to understand some of the rest of my, my talk. So um, let's take a look at that. Right, so what is a process? Um, the core of it, um, it's just uh, you, know, you want to run an executable, so the executable is the first thing that's there, and eventually the operating system um, will take that executable and uh, map it into memory at some point together with uh, the libraries that the executable probably needs to run 
and then uh, the dynamic linker gets involved and uh, sets things up so that uh, the functions that are in the library can actually be uh, used at runtime by the application. And I said the, the operating system uh, maps these things into memory somewhere, and that part of the uh, address space of the process is typically read only, so the application cannot change its own code while it's running, which is usually a good thing. Um, but of course, there's also other memory that the application needs at one time to, to have its own uh, function call stack and to see where it allocates memory. And uh, those parts are, of course, right home. And once the operating system has uh, set all these things up, it will arrange for the uh, process to start executing instructions from, uh, from the binary um, at the entry point of the main function. But of course, that can only happen once the um, once the scheduler of the operating system uh, makes the CPU available for the process to run. And um, next slide, please. Once it does that, um, it probably wants to have some access to the outside world because just executing instructions on a CPU by itself is not, not very interesting. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, a Linux or Unix process, uh, when it's newborn, is pretty much. Uh, blind and naked, there's not much access that it has to the outside world. Um, it does have uh, its command line arguments, those get passed uh, to the main function. I put the signature here so you can see um, the command line arguments getting passed there. So you can look at those. And it has access to the environment variables that were set when it was launched. Um, for that, you can use the, the getEnv function uh, I put here on this line. It also has access to uh, standard in and standard out, so it can read and write um, from that. And of course, uh, it has access to <laughs> the file system. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, the classic uh, Unix API uh, open, read, write, and close. But it's, uh, it's a bit hard to make use of the file system if you have no idea uh, where the interesting things in the file system are. So next slide. So what you will probably see uh, when the process starts running is that it will try to access the environment to find, uh, find certain environment variables, for example, uh, the XDG runtime deal environment variable um, tells it where the runtime deal is, where many of the interesting things in the file system are located. And uh, one of the things that it will find there is uh, sockets to talk to the uh, display server and to the debug team. I should explain that the socket is like a special file um, that uh, a service or uh, a service can put into the file system to uh, allow other applications to, to open the socket and basically start talking to the, to the service. It's a bit like a door where you like, um, can, can meet the service and, and start interacting with it. And uh, one of the sockets that most uh, desktop applications will want is the one for the uh, compositor. And there's an environment variable called wait and display that, uh, that gives you the name of that socket. And then there's a, another environment variable that's called dbus session bus address, which uh, has a bit of a different format, but um, if you look towards the end, you can see it also specifies the location in the file system where you find the socket to open the connection to the uh, dbus daemon and start uh, communicating there. So that's what most, uh, at least most desktop applications do. Right, so um, that was my um, little interlude on uh, the basics of uh, Linux processes. And now we can um, start uh, taking a look at some of the major uh, components of the desktop. Uh, so, next slide. And I want to start by um, looking at the uh, compositor. I've already mentioned uh, GNOME Shell when we looked at uh, the process tree. And um, GNOME Shell is the compositor that GNOME uses. And that is the component that um, has um, that controls access to the GPU and uh, that renders everything that you can see on the desktop at the end of the day in, in one form or another. And um, uh, applications um, talk to it uh, using the Wayland protocol and they, they use that um, socket I just mentioned on the last slide um, to do that. Of course, um, this is a bit of an idealized picture in reality. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that. Applications also have access uh, and use the GPU, of course, when they are uh, when they are rendering the content for their windows using uh, G OpenGL or Vulkan. Um, what I meant when I said uh, controls access to the GPU is that the compositor is the one 
the run process in the session that has uh, privileged access to the GPU and to the graphics APIs of the kernel. So the compositor, for example, can reconfigure displays and um, uh, change things like that, which a normal application wouldn't be able to do. So from a, uh, from a client perspective, um, the compositor is just a, uh, a valent uh, compositor. So uh, a client will open the valent socket to, and start uh, using the valent protocol to attack with the compositor. And, uh, the typical things that an uh, application will do is create a surface. In the past, we used to call it the window. Nowadays, surface is the preferred term. But that's basically just a rectangular area, somewhere on the screen where you want to show some, some content. And then um, the client will attach a buffer. The buffer is um, what contains the, the pixels that you want to show on screen. Uh, if you want to change what you show in your, in your window, you have to attach a new buffer. So that's what graphical applications do all day. They um, so okay. that they keep attaching new buffers for every frame where they want to like, uh, change what, what's going on there. Uh, typically, uh, most applications, um, the user is expected to attack with them in some way. So another thing that when clients will do is they will receive input events, uh, such as key presses or uh, mouse movements, and they will handle those so that the user can actually um, interact with the application. But um, the next major component uh, of the desktop that I want to talk about is uh, DBus which is uh, a communication bus where applications and services that are running in the session can talk to each other and make requests and function calls. And um, <coughs> the way that works is that um, the application again opens a socket. In this, in this case, it's the uh, DBus socket. And then there's the DBus protocol that you use to, to talk to um, both the DBus daemon itself and other applications on the bus. And that way, the applications can uh, interact with each other and with the DBus daemon itself. And DBus uh, offers not just this uh, communication bus, but it also is a, has a unique, uh, a convenient way to implement uniqueness for applications. Because um, what applications typically do when they connect to the bus is that they, they uh, own a name. A name is essentially like an address on the bus that others can, can use to to make requests of, of your application, but um, there can be only one owner for each name. So if, you, if the application uh, takes ownership of a name, that guarantees that there will be no other uh, owners for the same name. And that way, um, other instances of the same application, when they connect to the bus, they will see oh, the name is already owned, so I, I don't need to start up. I can just defer um, to the existing instance. So that, that is how uh, application uniqueness is generally implemented on the desktop. And beyond that, um, DBus also provides a way for the application to, um, to uh, register names in advance. So the application can basically uh, say, when I start, I, will, I want to own this name. And then DBus, the DBus daemon will use this information um, to activate the application. When, when, somebody, when somebody makes, makes a request, request of that name, name and uh, the application is not running yet, so the DBus daemon will notice, oh, somebody registered. Uh, this name already so I can launch the application to handle this request and and that's a common way how application get activated on the desktop nowadays they just get activated on the bus by via this mechanism next slide and from a, from a client perspective um, this is how it looks um, you connect to the um, to the debus socket and then one of the first things you will do is you you take ownership of, of a name and then you export uh, objects, and those objects can implement interfaces. Uh, and, and then you handle, handle method calls when other applications um, send requests using those interfaces and the methods that they implement. And you can also, um, of course, call into other applications and make requests of them. Um, yeah. Next slide. Before moving on from DBus, I wanted to briefly um, illustrate uh, one aspect of this, and I'm not sure how well you can see this, it's a bit, a bit squashed, but uh, I try to uh, make a drawing here and I'm not really an artist, so uh, bear with me. But um, I have two applications here, App A and App B, and uh, in the middle there's the Dbus daemon. The Dbus daemon is just another process like any other process, so 
Uh, those are three processes. And um, application A and application B both have connected to the, to the bus, so they have a, a socket connection to the dbus daemon, and now application A wants to make a, send a dbus message to application B. So what's actually happening is that application A will write this message to, to its socket, and then the data actually travels to the kernel, um, to the other end of the socket, which is the dbus daemon, and the dbus daemon will look at it and recognize, oh, this needs to be sent to application B, so it, it forwards it to its end of the socket connection to application B, and then it travels again through the kernel, because that's how sockets work, and eventually reaches application B, which then looks at it and sees, oh, maybe this was a method call, so I need to send a response back, and the response will, will travel just the same way in the opposite direction. And you may think that's a lot of, that's a lot of steps for, for a single interaction, but that's not really a problem. And for, for normal things, this works quite fine. So we don't really think much about it, and we, we think it's, it's just a bus, even though it's just a bunch of point-to-point -point connections. Um, sometimes when you want to send a lot of data, say you want to transfer a big image or something, or a, a lot of um, binary data, that then it might be advantageous to um, avoid sending it over dbus itself and rather uh, negotiate a more direct connection between the two applications that avoids the extra indirection through the dbus daemon. Okay, so much for dbus. Um, the next major component of the desktop I, I want to talk about is Flatpak. And uh, I have to say that Flatpak is a very complex system and uh, deserves a whole talk of its own. So I can't really uh, explain everything about Flatpak, but I wanted to still um, at least mention a few of the functionalities you should have in mind when you hear the, the name Flatpak. And so you have some idea what it's about, even though you may not know everything in detail. Um, so one slogan for Flatpak is um, containers for desktop apps. And that might help you if you have some idea what containers are. Um, you may not, so let me, let me briefly explain a bit of, uh, about containers. Um, if you think back to my, my first section where I talked about processes, um, we saw that there's, there's a bunch of comp ingredients that go into running a process. You need to have an executable and like the library that it depends on, and you need to have um, the memory set up in the right way, and you need to know which data files it wants to access. So containers uh, are, at the end of the day, just a way to take all these ingredients for setting up a process and wrapping them in a little image file. Like typically, a container image is a tarball or a zip file, and that contains the, the executable that you want to run and probably all the libraries that it, that it needs to, uh, to run, um, and a list of, and maybe it also contains data files that the application needs at, when it's running. And, and then there might be some extra information like what, uh, what uh, access it needs to various uh, systems on the host system and a little recipe for how all this needs to be put together to uh, let the process run. And all that gets wrapped up into a container image and um, then you can get it from somewhere. Like distribution is an important part of uh, the container world. So if, if you run a Docker container, you get the container image from a Docker registry, which is just a web service that lets you download these things. And for Flatpak, um, Flatpak does just the same things as, as Docker, basically just with a focus on desktop applications. So it's using more or less the same uh, Linux kernel um, technologies to, that Docker does, like bind mounts or namespaces and C groups and seccomp and fuse file systems. And, and it, it uses all these things just um, with a bit of a focus on making sure that desktop applications can work work well, but um, yes, distribution, I was talking about distribution. So in the Docker world, you have the Docker registry, which serves container images in the Docker file format. And Flatpak has a similar thing. For Flatpak, we call it remotes. And uh, one of the most uh, central ones we have is FlatHub, which is basically the, the one big uh, remote where you can go and you can find lot of, lots of uh, applications that are packaged as Flatpak uh, container images at the end of the day. And um, so you can install them from there, and installing them means not just downloading the image, um, but also um, doing deployment, which for in a flat pack case involves taking a few of the pieces that are wrapped into this, into this image and install them on the system so that the application can function like a normal desktop application. For example, after you install the flat pack application, it'll show up if you go to the shell overview where all the applications are listed, the flat pack apps will show up with their icon and their name, just like any other application would. And, and those 
the icon and the name, they get extracted from the container image when you deploy the Flatpak on your system. Um, so that, that's all parts of what Flatpak does. And yeah, I, I talked a bit about how there's a recipe in the container image that tells you how you need to, to like take all the piece, bits and pieces out of the container image and, and set them all up so that you can run the process. And um, that's just the same for Flatpak. So um, there's, a lot, there's a bunch of setup to do uh, for setting up the environment for the application to run. So you cannot just run the binary by itself. You need to use a command like the one I have down here on the slide, Flatpak run, and then the name of the Flatpak here, org mozilla.firefox. And that, that basically tells Flatpak to do this work, to like take the container image and um, set everything up and then launch the process in, in this, what we call, we call this the a sandbox. Basically, that's what the, the Flatpak run command sets up for the process to run in. Next slide. And yeah, once the application, once all that is done, the application finds itself in this, in this sandbox. And um, what it sees there, first and foremost, is a somewhat restricted view of the file system. So we don't let a Flatpak app see all the host system files or all the files in the, in the user's home directory, but only the ones that it's, it's allowed to have access to and that it, it's meant to see. And, um, but what we crucially do make available to the application is uh, the Wayland socket and the Dbus socket, so the application can function like a normal desktop app would by connecting to those and then start interacting with the compositor and with other applications via Dbus. And I can move on from Flatpak without talking a little bit about portals. I mentioned them here in the, the middle slide. So portals are uh, essentially just um, Dbus APIs that the application can talk to because it has the Dbus socket. And uh, they are somewhat high level. They provide access to functionality from the, from the host system that the app inside the uh, Flatpak sandbox might need. Uh, one example would be, say, opening a file. Like you have an application that can uh, present a file and you wanted to open a file that is on your, in your home directory somewhere so it's not available in the restricted view of the file system so the, so the application can just open it by itself. It needs to make a request to the uh, file chooser portal to uh, make this file available to it. And uh, a key part of the idea of portals is that there's user interaction involved. So this, uh, this functionality is pretty high level. A user has a good idea of like there's files on my system and uh, the application wants to, wants to get a file so it makes sense that the portal can just present a dialogue to the user and say, please select the file for the app to use. And then the user can, can either select the file or it can cancel the dialogue and thereby uh, deny the request that the application made by calling into the portal. Okay, next slide. Can you switch to the next slide? Okay, uh, so we've seen a few of the major components of the desktop now and um, for the remainder of the talk I want to switch gears a little bit and um, take a deeper dive, a, a more detailed look at one particular um, a bit of functionality and see how you can like, uh, follow the thread from the surface, like from the, what you see in the UI um, to the various uh, levels of the, um, of the code and um, the various interacting processes and modules and find out what's actually going on. Uh, I hope this is a bit similar to what you would do if you want to like track down a bug, bug that you've seen in, in an application or whether, whether you want to find out where you could implement a bit of missing functionality that you want to have. So hopefully that is useful to um, uh, doing these things, even if the example itself is maybe not the most inspiring. I, I picked the example of um, opening a file. So to set the stage, imagine that you, you're running an application, either one that you've written yourself <coughs> or one that you just installed as a flatpak. And that application has produced a bit of data uh, in, in the form of a file. Not really that important what kind of data it is. It could be a PDF or it could be an image or maybe an, an iCal, like a calendar appointment or something of that sort. In any case, the application has a button and you click that button to open the file. And after a brief moment, another application pops up and shows you the content of that file um, because it knows how to handle that. And that, that's pretty nice. but. How does that happen? So let, let's see if we can um, dive a little bit into uh, the mechanics behind that. If you go to the next slide. 
So um, let's further assume that um, you have access to the source code of this application, so we can start our investigation by looking at the code, and let's assume the application is written in GTK. So what you'll probably see when you find the place where this button you just clicked on is implemented, you'll see that it uh, creates a, an object called a GTK file launcher for this file. And then the application calls GTK file launcher launch. And now we want to like dig down and find out what's going on. So we, we switch to looking at the GTK source code and we'll find that function GTK file launcher launch. And if we look at it, uh, we'll see that it, um, after a few durations, it um, makes a dbus call to, the, to one of those portals I mentioned earlier. It calls the open URI portal and specifically a method called open file. If you want to go to the next slide. So uh, at this stage in our investigation, uh, we could draw a diagram that looks a bit like this. We have the application that we started out in and indirectly via GTK, the application makes a dbus call to the portals, to one of the portals. And uh, it'll become uh, clear later why I wrote portal front end here. So ignore that for now. If you go to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to point out at this point already that we have crossed the boundary here. The application is running, it's, a, it's running as a flat bag, so it's in its sandbox. And the portals are, are running outside the sandbox. They are part of the session. So the portals have full access to um, all the functionality and all the files in the user form directory. And we cross this boundary by making this dbus call. So it is a bit of a security boundary, you can say, because we want to restrict what the application can do and um, the portals are unrestricted. So that, let's keep that in mind as we go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, the portal front end that we just called into with the open file call um, has access to the file because the file is one of the arguments that you pass to the open file method. And the first thing it will do is um, determine uh, what kind of file it is, so find out the file type. On Linux, uh, file types are usually represented by MIME types, things like uh, I have a few examples here, image slash PNG would be one, or application slash PDF, another one. Um, and then once we have that file type, um, the, the portal front end can um, find applications that can handle files of this type, and then it'll have to pick one somehow. Uh, we'll get to that later, but first um, let's look a little bit more in detail about at the first step here. Go to the next slide. So um, how do you determine the type of a file? Uh, one way to go about this would be like if you want to find out if this file that you have is an image, contains an image, you could just pass the file to an image viewer and see if it shows you an image or it throws an error. But that's a bit um, impractical and high overhead. Um, so usually we allow ourselves some shortcuts. So typically what you'll do is uh, we'll just um, look at the beginning of the file and we look for telltale byte sequences that tell us uh, what kind of data might be in there. Or maybe we are even more basic and we just look at the file name and we say, oh, the file name ends with .png, so it's probably an image. Um, but if we go back to look at the, the portal front-end code, we'll find that it actually uses um, a glib or more specifically a GIO API to determine the file type. The function is called something like gfile info get content type. And for the, for the portal, that is nice because that means we can get a file type without having to worry too much about the details of how the, the actual implementation makes the determination that yes, this was an image file or no, it was a PDF. But we are curious, so we can look at the, at the glib code and if we do that, we look at the implementation of this function, we'll find um, that it uses um, um, a bunch of data files from a file location uh, that I put here, slash user, slash share, slash mime. That's uh, uh, called the shared MIME database, which contains a lot of information of, for how you can determine whether a file actually is an image or a PDF. All right. But let's assume we know now that it's um, that it is that the file is of this type, and the next step is that we need to find out uh, possible handlers for this file type. So we want to uh, the portal wants to find a list of of files, uh, a list of applications that, that can handle this file type. Uh, so it calls another um, glib function. And in this case, it's called um, gapp info find all for type. And if you look at, uh, at the glib code, we'll see that this function returns a list of app info structs. Um, looking uh, at those structs reveals that they are 
um, essentially uh, just a list of there's a, an executable in there or more, more precisely there's a, a command line in there that tells you how you launch the application which parameters you need to pass and so on and then there's a little bit of extra metadata like an icon and a, a display name so that you can actually present the application in the UI and glib uh, finds this data by by reading the desktop files that are stored in, in the location I put here at the bottom, slash user, slash share, slash <coughs> applications. If you go to the next slide. And I wanted to take the, this uh, opportunity here to have a brief detour, talk about um, these directories. We've now seen two examples of um, directories where um, databases are stored. The first one was the MIME database in, in user share MIME. And then we've had the application database or desktop files in in slash user slash share applications. And I just wanted to point out here that there's a common pattern for how these um, uh, directories are organized. Um, this is following the base directory specification, which uh, some people wrote down a long time ago. Essentially, there's, uh, there's two uh, environment variables called XDG data home and XDG data dears, which uh, each list, uh, each contain a list of uh, directories, um, the XDG data home is usually used for having a location inside the user's home directory, and XDG data dears, uh, has a has one or more locations uh, for system data. And then um, uh, the locations where the application databases actually looked for are uh, constructed by, by taking each of the entries from, the, from these environment variables and uh, looking for the application subdirectory in each of these locations. And then you get a list like the one I put here where you have First, uh, the first entry in the list, dot locals share applications, is uh, uh, inside the user's home directory, so that is coming from XCG data home. Then the next entry is slash user slash share applications. We've already seen that. That is the, the standard system location. And then at the bottom, there's another location that Flatpak adds to the list of system locations so that it can inject its own um, desktop files into the list. And basically, the same principle applies for the MIME types and for a bunch of other data sources where we have a database that is basically spread across multiple directories. Okay, so now we can update our diagram a little bit because now we've learned that the, the portal front end is consulting first the shared MIME info database and then the, the desktop files um, to come up with the, the file type and the list of handlers um, that can handle it. Can you go to the next slide? And um, looking at the list of things that it, it's going to do, um, now it's time that it, it can actually um, take this list of potential handlers that it has found and can call into the portal backend uh, to choose one of these handlers for actually handling the file we have at hand. And I wanted to briefly um, talk here about this split between a portal front end and a portal back end and why we do that. Um, so I already mentioned that. Um, the portal front ends kind of implement a security boundary for the sandbox applications to access uh, the wider world. And since it's a security boundary, we kind of want it to be implemented in a small and auditable process that does not have all the complications of uh, UI code and, and so on and so forth. So for that reason, all the code that does UI work and presents dialogues to the user is uh, separated out into a portal backend process and that keeps the portal front end process small and hopefully um, secure. There's another advantage to this split and that is that since all the UI code is separated out into the backends, we can actually arrange for different backends to be running depending on which desktop, in, <coughs> which desktop environment is running in the user session. So if you're running a GNOME session, you'll get, you can get GTK dialogues and if you're running a KDE a desktop, you can get Qt dialogues because they can run different portal backends while they're still sharing the portal front end implementation, which is handling things like permissions and policies, so the policies are uh, unified and don't depend on which desktop you're, you're running. So the, the diagram now um, is getting a little more convoluted. The portal front end has called into the back end, and uh, the job of the back end is relatively straightforward. If you go to the next slide, it essentially just presents a dialogue to the user, like we have a list of potential handler applications, so we need the user to choose one of these. Um, so we'll show a dialogue like this one. It's pretty unreadable, but you 
can maybe make out that this is a GTK dialog. So since we are, in, we are running a GNOME session, so we'll get a, the GTK UI. And once the user has clicked on, on one of these handles, um, the portal backend sends that information back to the front end. And um, now the front end um, looks like it's almost ready to launch the, the handler, right? We have, we have the file, we, have the, we know which application we want to handle it, but there's one further complication that um, delays things a little bit because it could be that the handler application itself is packaged as a flat pack. And if you rem remember what I said earlier, uh, inside a flat pack sandbox, you have a very restricted view of the file system. So if you launch, just launch the handler, it probably is not going to be able to see this file that we got from another application. So what the portal front end needs to do is it needs to take some extra steps to make sure that the handler can actually uh, see the file and for that. It exports the file um, using the document store. If you go to the next slide, uh, I'll take a brief detour to explain a little bit how that works. So the restricted view that uh, flat packs have of the file system, uh, uh, in the default case, it only includes a little play area for each application in, in the user's home directory in a location called .var slash app slash the app ID. So each, each flat pack gets its own little area in the file system there where it can store configuration files and its own data and things like that. Um, and then um, the document store is also made available to each flat pack. So the document store is a fuse file system that gets managed by, a, by the document store service um, and it gets mounted both outside uh, in the session, in the user session and inside each running flat pack. And, and it gets mounted in a location that you can see here the second uh, pass there, slash run, slash user 1000. That's the XTG runtime there that I had shown earlier. And then there's a doc uh, directory. That's where the document store gets mounted. And if you, if you look at it outside the sandbox, you, you get the full view of the document store, like um, all the files that are exported there. Um, and inside the sandbox of a flat pack, we only mount a section of that. So there's a subdirectory called by app, and that has a subdirectory for each uh, flat pack. And we'll only mount this, this slice of the document store inside um, the running uh, flat pack sandbox for the app with that app ID. So each app only gets to see the files that are meant for it. And one advantage of having this extra interaction and this complication is that um, we can actually decide when we when the file gets exported, we can decide if we want to allow the application to, to write the file or just read the file, which is something that you normally don't have in, like if you run a, an unsandbox app in the user session, it has full access to all the files of the user and it can modify them all, delete them, do whatever. So that's not a great thing if you don't know about that app and whether it's trustworthy. So this is actually a nice advantage of, of this extra indirection that we can enforce that the app cannot modify the file. Right, so um, back to our diagram. Now um, the portal backend has passed the handler back, the selected handler back to the portal frontend, and the portal frontend has talked to the document store to export the file. Uh, so now we're finally in a position that we can actually um, do the last step of this, uh, this thing and launch the handler. If you go back to look at the portal frontend code, we'll find that it once again uses uh, a glib API for doing so. Um, the function we can call there is something like gapp info launch URIs. And um, that function, if we look at the implementation, we'll find that that function um, actually uses um, dbus activation, which is the thing I, I mentioned earlier. You can activate an app on the bus. And that is typically how gapp info launch URIs will launch the handler. So if we, if we go back to our diagram one more time, um, we can add this last step in here where uh, the portal front end indirectly via glib um, talks to dbus and makes it activate the handler um, for the file. And with that, I think we have a full picture of how, of what is happening when you click on that button to open the file. And it's, it's kind of amazing that the, this whole complex system of interactions between various processes and databases and, and uh, other components of the desktop magically uh, makes the right application window open as you click on that button. And with that, I'm at the end of my 
expose of desktop technologies. And if you have any questions, please ask them now. Yes. Okay, so I noticed that you were focusing quite a lot on flat packs. So is it just that GNOME natively has support for running flat pack applications or are the all essential GNOME applications packed into flat pack in a separate? Uh, yeah, um, yes, it's, it's true. I, d I did focus uh, quite a bit on flat pack because that is the, I guess, the modern way to distribute applications and um, get them in a way that is, um, I think, actually better than having them packaged in a traditional package because you get the advantages of the isolation uh, where you, you can control what the application is able to do. And um, that means you don't have to trust so much that you only install applications that don't ever do any bad things because they are running unsandboxed and can do whatever with, you, with all your data. Um, if, you, if you run them as a flat pack, you get some extra assurances that um, they only get to interact with the system in a way that, that you allow them to interact with the system. So there's some advantages um, there. Okay, so that means currently all the um, core GNOME applications are without the sand space. And are there any plans in the GNOME environment to uh, eventually port them over to Flatpak and use them as the default versions? <coughs> yeah, so um, packaging applications at flat, as Flatpaks um, can be easy sometimes and it can be difficult sometimes. It depends a bit on uh, whether the application is very intricately, intricately intertwined with the rest of the system. There are some applications that just uh, are a lot more difficult to package in isolation, like or to enforce these boundaries. A typical example would be a file manager like Nautilus. Um, the main task of that application is to just like access the whole file system. So it's not really useful to like wrap it in a container that has a restricted view of the file system. So uh, flat packs make more sense for some applications than for others. And, and therefore, um, some of the core applications may just never get there, or maybe uh, it may still be worthwhile to put them in a flat pack just because you can take advantage of the, uh, the distribution mechanism. Like you can still install it as a flat pack, but maybe it is, it is uh, not isolated and not sandboxed strictly. Flatpak has ways to um, to limit the the amount of isolation that you do. As you like, basically you can you can give the application more access to the system than it by default would have in a flatpak, and that is a way you can. I mean, you can put Nautilus, for example, in a in a flatpak container, but still have it have a full view of the file system, and we may move more and more in that direction. So um, maybe that's not sure. That's a great answer, but that's the answer I have. Everybody, thank you. Uh, so continuing over that uh, previous question, I would like to ask uh, if uh, uh, every distro that readily shifts uh, with the uh, default desktop environment GNOME uh, will ever eliminate uh, the other packages like the packages and RPM packages with the flat pack? Um, I don't know. I, I can't speak for them. Uh, it's, it seems unlikely to me. <laughs> but um, uh, you can dream. I don't know. I mean, there's certainly there's, um, um other things like, uh, for example, uh, GNOME OS, which is like a, an effort by people in the upstream GNOME community to, like, to build a testable uh, OS image, which is immutable and uh, has always the latest GNOME to, to test it. And, um, and that's, an, that's an environment where you only use flat packs, basically, because the underlying OS is immutable, like Fedora Silverblue, for example, is another, is another example of trying to make an immutable base OS system. And then, then you have no alternative then you have to install every application as a in a containerized format. That could be Flatpak, it could also be Snap or some other technology. But um, and there's a lot of interest in in these immutable systems. Like I think Ubuntu also has a uh, Ubuntu Core Desktop initiative, which is basically the same idea. You make the the core OS immutable, and then you install all the apps uh, as containers. And for, uh, Ubuntu obviously uses Snaps for that, but uh, it's really the same idea at the end of the day. And whether, whether we'll get to a future where that is the default and traditional packages don't exist anymore, I, I can't predict. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Sure. 
Hello. So um, your presentation, your slide about flatback was very insightful. I want to learn more about flatback, uh, how complicated it is and how intricate it is. Intricate. I want to ask you one thing. Um, I see snaps, uh, snap uh, packaging uh, CLI tools and I have used them a lot in uh, deploying a server like um, say Node.js, uh, I use snap. Will there be any future like uh, Flatpak are also available for CLI tools? Um, so what I said when I, when I introduced Flatpak was that it's, it's a container system that's very focused on making desktop applications work well, but uh, there's nothing really stopping you from, from packaging a command line tool in a, in a, in a Flatpak container. It, you can do that. I mean, there's maybe some, some convenience functionality is missing for that for that use case just because it's outside of the make desktop apps work well use case that we focused on initially. But um, there's no principal obstacles to doing that. You could, it, it has just never been uh, a focus. Well, there and is this a case like uh, we don't see many, uh, I think almost zero, there are zero apps that are uh, CLI based in yeah. Flatpak. Yeah, and in part this is I think uh, a question about UX and um, like how do you like, one, one aspect of Flatpak that, that we find is attractive is that it's well integrated, say, in app stores like GNOME software can present um, Flatpak applications just like any other application. You can get screenshots and you can get the UI descriptions and all, the, all that thing works just like you would expect for desktop applications. Mm. But for command line tools, you don't have screenshots, so like you yes. cannot really present them well there. So there was some, I guess, some hesitance to like embrace it too much and then like end up with like um, a lot of different to present, dif difficult to present applications in, in the app store, but um, the technology works, uh, I think, just to, just the same. <coughs> so if you want to do it, you can. Thank you. We are truly grateful to have Mr. Mattis with us here, delivering such an enlightening talk. So now I would like to inform you all present here that our next session will be GNOME extensions, the key to more users and developers by Mr. Aryan Kaushik at track A, the seminar hall. I extend my apology for the inconvenience. I request everyone to move accordingly. Thank you. It's in a very style, but no, it's